There are 12 participants on the call, including you. You are joining your conference as a participant. For a menu of available commands, press star pound. Your connection is now in listen-only mode. And I'm on staff here at the ATRC. And today's webinar is entitled Walking School Bus Implementation, Stories from the Field. This webinar builds off a previous training in January offered by one of our wonderful partners uh, in Safe Routes to School, uh, the Safe Routes to School National Partnership, uh, who introduced a new resource on how to start walking school bus programs. As many of you already know, walking school bus programs encourage physical activity, enhance pedestrian safety, and improve air quality by replacing auto travel with active travel. Students traveling by walking school bus are accompanied by trained walking leaders who travel on selected routes with designated stops, much like a traditional, walk, uh, traditional school bus program. Today, our focus is slightly different in that we'll be hearing from two local jurisdictions here in beautiful California who are actively implementing walking school bus programs for students as part of their Safe Routes to School initiative. We'll also be receiving an update on the Walking School Bus Toolkit that was introduced in January from our partners. But first, sorry, uh, slide jump. We're gonna go back a little bit more. One more. One more. Nope, to our introductory slide. Yep, that's it. <laughs> no worries. Um, but first, as a reminder, this webinar is hosted by the Caltrans Active Transport uh, Transportation Resource Center. Our Active Transportation Resource Center provides resources um, utilizing a combination of subject matter experts from Caltrans as well as the California Department of Public Health, California State University, University Sacramento, which is also known as CSUS, and various other non-infrastructure and safe routes to school and infrastructure experts. And we exist primarily to support Caltrans Active Transportation Program awardees at the local and regional levels, but we also do extensive support for those that are interested in getting active transportation programs and safer to school started in, in your regions. Next slide, please. Okay. So some basic housekeeping before we get launch into our presentation. Please use your phone for audio for this webinar. Hopefully everyone um, that's on the slides now can access the, the phone uh, if they haven't already done so. Um, we are putting all participants in listen-only modes, so we're muting your phones for you. And then finally, if you have difficulties, please use the contact support link in the calendar invitation for this webinar. Okay, next slide, please. We will be recording this webinar and posting it to the Active Transportation uh, Resource Center website, which has a new address. Um, and that's caatpresources.org. Um, and then finally, um, as a reminder, questions are extremely encouraged. And the way you can do that is by entering questions into the chat feature at any time. We're gonna give each speaker a chance to answer one or two questions that, um, that have come in um, after his or her presentation. And then we're gonna have a longer Q&A after all the presentations have been completed. Okay, next slide. So as always, we, this is a learning opportunity and we have specific learning objectives for, for those that are on the phone with us today. Um, by the end of this webinar, we hope that you'll be able to identify one or more strategies for starting up a walking school bus program. Um, you'll also be able to identify one or more potential challenges and solutions when running a program and keeping it sustained over the long term. Um, and then finally, what we hope you'll be able to access walking school bus resources through the Safe Routes to School National Partnership and then also through the Active Transportation Resource Center website. Next slide. Our speakers today are wonderful and veterans of the Safe Routes to School movement. We're very excited and pleased to have them. First, we'll start off with Michelle Lieberman, who is, serves as the Technical Assistance Manager for the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. In her role, she provides technical assistance through the National Partnership's Emerging Consulting Program to local communities around the country that are seeking to improve their built environment and Safe Routes to School initiatives. Her background and expertise spans urban planning, public health, active transportation, 
neighborhood revitalization, and policy development. Uh, following, sorry, <laughs> can you go back to the bio, sorry. Then we'll have Lloyd Nadal, who is going to speak about, uh, oh, sorry, who is the Safe Routes to School Program Administrator for the Solano Transportation Authority. In his previous role, um, we're going to hear extensively about that, that the work that Solano is doing um, is one of our primary presentations. Um, but we also wanted to highlight that in uh, Lloyd's previous role, he served as the Children and Youth Program Manager for the California Department of Health Nutrition Education and Obesity Prevention Grants um, uh, Program, and supporting uh, supplemental nutrition um, education eligible youth and families across the state. And Lloyd has um, worked extensively locally and statewide, um, providing training, technical assistance, and consultation to support health and well-being of, of youth. Uh, next, we'll have Betsy Beaver, who's going to be joining Lloyd in his presentation. Um, and she is a central part of Solano Transportation Authority's Safe Routes to School team. Um, and we're really pleased to have Betsy today, um, who's going to be giving us more of an on-the-ground perspective um, about her work doing walking school buses in the county of Solano. And then our last speaker today is Jim Shanman, who is the Culver City Safe Routes to School coordinator and runs the Culver City Walk and, Roll, Walk and Rollers program a relatively new organization whose vision is to create a community where children and parents alike are comfortable using active transportation whenever they choose. He's also the co-founder of the Culver City Bicycle Organization, excuse me, Culver City Bicycle Coalition, and is certified as a League of American Bicyclists um, LCI. So knows his stuff. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, and then one last thing before we get to the presentations themselves. Um, just so that we know who's on the phone and a, representation, a representative of who's on the phone, we'd like you to complete um, this poll question. Please select your best response to describe your current stage of walking school bus programming. So your choices are, I'm not yet involved in a walking school bus program, um, but I am curious to know more. Um, the second choice is, I'm just starting my walking school bus program. And then the third is that I've, I'm revising my walking school bus program, which implies that you've been kind of doing the work and you're really here for um, some tips and tools about um, keeping it afloat. All right, and we're going to give about 50, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, okay, um, to let everyone respond. Okay, um, and I think we have everyone um, who, has answered, so um, I think, can I, I just look at the, that piece right there and give the results, is that the way it works? Okay, all right, so we know that we have about 30, almost 40% of you who are actually not involved in a walking school bus program yet, but you're really curious to know more. Um, and then after that, um, we've, we had um, the largest response from those who are all already um, in a walking, uh, sorry, revising their walking school bus program. So that's about 30%. So, and then the others um, haven't uh, answered, and there's just, and then there's a little over 10% who are just getting started. So, hopefully, that helps our speakers as well to know who's on the uh, call with them today. And on that note, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker, who's going to be Michelle Lieberman from the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. Michelle, would you unmute yourself and let us know you're ready to start? All right, can you hear me? We can. Okay. All right, take it away, Michelle. Thanks, thank you, Victoria. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, today, I wanna give a little bit of an update on our toolkit implementation, the step-by-step -step toolkit. Uh, next slide. We published the toolkit in October 2016, so it's been almost six months um, since it's been published. And earlier this year in January, um, we held an introductory webinar um, that walked through the different components and sections of the toolkit and all the resources um, that are contained within the toolkit. Next slide. So I hope everybody has had a chance to um, take a look at the toolkit and read through the different sections and look at all of the resources that are involved. If you haven't, you can go to our website, saferoutespartnership.org. Um, the easiest way to get to the toolkit is to um, go to the resources section and under our publications. If you scroll down, um, the toolkit will be listed in there under step-by-step -step walking school bus toolkit. 
um, along with the PDF of the full toolkit, um, there's also the links to the individual customizable resources, um, and, like forms and press releases and all that stuff that are within the toolkit, um, referenced within the toolkit. And so um, you can download all of those there. Next slide, please. Um, so since we launched the toolkit about six months ago, we've had over 1,000 downloads of it. So it's really exciting. Um, we have three more formal pilot sites that we're following along as they use the toolkit and we're receiving um, feedback from them. Um, so two of them you'll hear from today, Solano County and Culver City. Um, and we're also working with a group in the Fresno area that will be using parts of the toolkit. Um, these pilot sites are receiving technical assistance from us and trainings um, as needed. Um, besides these pilot sites, we've heard from other communities in California and also um, from other parts of the country that have told us they're using some or all of the toolkit or are intending to use um, some or all, all of the toolkit. Um, and it's really interesting because we're seeing interest in walking school buses from a number of different um, types of groups and the program is being started and implemented um, from what we see in terms of you know, traditional partners, schools, school districts, um, sometimes it's led by transportation or public health. And we've also seen involvement um, by law enforcement departments and faith-based organizations. So this is really showing to us that um, a lot of communities and a lot, a lot of different sectors are really seeing the benefits of walking school buses in terms of not only safety, um, but increased you know, health benefits and physical activity benefits, as well as it being a fun and engaging program um, for kids to get to get them from school. So it's really, really exciting to see this toolkit um, help those communities out and for the programs to start taking off. Next slide. So in terms of future plans, um, we are developing a brief informational sheet that communities can use to um, help recruit potential leaders and partners and provide some you know, basic information from that for them without having to have them go through the entire toolkit. Um, and we're also tracking toolkit usage and we would love to hear your feedback. Um, so let us know um, moving forward if you're using part of the toolkit or using all of the toolkit, um, how you used it, and you know, feel free to send us along any feedback um, as you do so. Next slide. Um, and so here is my contact information, um, and you, know, you can get this one in the, the webinars posted online as well, and we'd love to hear from you as you implement the toolkit. Thank you. Great, Michelle, thank you so much for that update on the toolkit. Um, and I'm not seeing any questions in the chat feature right now, so, um, but if you do have any questions about the toolkit right now that you would like Michelle to answer during our question and answer period, um, please uh, use that chat uh, button. And um, what we'll do now is switch over to Lloyd and Betsy, Lloyd Nadal and Betsy Beavers from the Solano Transportation Authority. Um, can we get a sound check from you guys? Victoria, can you hear me? We can, okay, great. All right, take it away, Lloyd. Great, uh, thank you all for joining the uh, webinar today and thank you again, Victoria, for having us um, and, and Michelle as well. Um, again, my name is Lloyd Nadal. I'm with the uh, Solano Transportation Authority managing the Safe Routes to School program. I'm here with my colleague, Betsy Beavers, who's also a program coordinator with us. I'm really excited here to, to talk about sort of the evolution of our walking school bus program and which hopefully will be um, somewhat helpful for you all in your implementation efforts. Um, so just briefly, I know that you know there's a lot of great walking school bus models out there. Um, we're lucky to have a lot of programs, great safe routes to school programs right here in our backyard in the Bay Area. Um, and obviously there's some great resources that Michelle just um, mentioned in terms of the toolkit that we're also using. Um, however, we know also that the walking school bus um, implementation or just getting the walking school buses going is not that easy to do and um, definitely a challenge to sustain. And so you know we've been learning as we're going. Um, and really trying to figure out the best ways to do this and um, sort of have evolved in, in a lot of ways, which I look forward to sharing with you and Betsy and I um, around how uh, we've been successful and some of the challenges that we face that may be helpful to you all as well. So, um, so today we'll, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our program, how our structure, how, how we are structured actually has helped us learn um, the best ways to support the program. Um, and then uh, finally, I think uh, Bethy uh, is going to share a little bit about some stories about how we've been able to work with some great partners um, at the school level to make, make this happen. So next slide, please. 
So just briefly, um, so Solano Safe Routes to School, School Program has been around since 2008, working with all seven cities in our county. Um, I've had the pleasure to work and live in several counties, and as uh, Victoria mentioned, work statewide uh, with a lot of the counties. And, and in my opinion, um, now that I live here in Solano County and Vallejo, um, there isn't a place that's whose cities are all sort of uniquely different from one another in terms of geography, population, socioeconomic status, diversity. So, um, you know, my staff and I, are, we're constantly trying to meet the needs of our cities and schools and make the program as relevant as we can, knowing how different it is um, in each of the cities and within the neighborhoods in the cities. Um, uh, you know, we, we are always trying to uh, tailor it and customize it as best we can. Um, so currently we work with about 75 schools countywide. Um, we've worked mostly with elementary and middle, but this year we just started a high school youth engagement program um, supporting eight high schools, so we're excited to get that off the ground. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a local sales tax measure for transportation, but we've been fortunate enough to receive ATP grants, um, support from our two air districts, and funding and buy-in from our own agency um, to complete a lot of infrastructure, safe process school infrastructure projects in all seven cities. And so it's something I'm going to talk about um, as, in terms of our success has been really built on the collaboration and relationships that we have with our cities, public work departments, um, schools and districts, police departments, and county public health. Next slide, please. So here's a, sort of a kind of a blueprint of how we're organized. Um, you know, the, the STA, the Solano Transportation Authority, is a joint powers authority, a JPA, that's governed by um, the Solano County Supervisor and the seven mayors of each city, which helps us um, work directly with the cities and the school districts um, together. Uh, and, and we have community uh, task force in each city that help to develop uh, our programs and help to give us feedback on um, doing infrastructure projects in each of the cities as well. So we're lucky to be organized in such a way where um, I think we're a uh, small enough county, but um, big enough in some way too to kind of get buy-in from everybody at the table, which has been one of our strengths. Um, we also have a countywide advisory committee uh, that consists of members of public health, each of the cities, our county superintendent, um, and so uh, that that committee helps to govern a lot of what we do as well, so that we have a sort of a heavily vetted process. Next slide. So speaking of which, I just wanted to share a little busy slides. I apologize, but just kind of again in terms of vetting and what we do, um, especially in terms of infrastructure projects. Um, a lot of the, this is a sort of our process of how we try to make sure that community and, and everybody's engaged in this process, from our steering committee to the task force, um, running it by city council and the school board, um, and the school, schools and ta school task force as well. We want to make sure that everything we do is um, you know, shared with the principals, the parents, volunteers, uh, staff members, city, that, that we're, we're, we're trying to be the bridge to get everyone to work together. And so this is sort of an example of how we move forward um, and, and determining our projects and how we implement them and so that we have success all the way through. Next slide. And then just wanted to kind of share with you, I think in relation to the walking school bus implementation and, and um, Michelle mentioned some of the things that the National Safe Routes is supporting, which definitely aligns with what we're doing. Um, you know, we just feel like we can't promote walking school buses, even walking and biking if we're not addressing student travel safety. And so as I mentioned before in our county, um, each city is geographically uh, different in, in certain ways, you know, we have rural, urban, um, suburban uh, areas and pockets and uh, around schools there's different, uh, in, in the environment around schools is different. So we really are trying to look more succinctly at addressing travel safety, um, particularly some of the uh, uh, collision information and, and how we can reduce all that activity around schools. We have a, a, a highway that runs through a couple cities and things like that, which I'm sure may be familiar in other, other counties as well. And we want to make sure that the schools get the education, um, you know, to really address that more head on and also um, look at the environment and how we can um, alleviate some of those challenges. And then really quickly in terms of physical activity, we want to be more um, succinct about trying to increase physical activity among our students. Uh, that's where the walking school bus comes into play. We want to be in every school if we can. Um, we also are working with uh, physical ed education teachers to try to make that connection with before, during, and after school physical activity. So it's, there's, uh, you know, folks at the school level and maybe even at the district level are kind of sort of catalyzing physical activity as a way, like different programs that are working together to kind of increase, increase that. Um, and then just trying to do it holistically at the county level to see how we can um, show how more active our students are being um, given the rates of obesity and diabetes and so forth. Next slide. 
So just a picture, um, so this is from our International Walk to School Day 2016. Um, just wanted to highlight that uh, these are uh, pictures of four of our mayors across the uh, county um, with students for that day. And so again, because of our structure and um, how, we're, how, we're, how our structure works, um, the mayors are all always participating um, on that day and we get considerable buy-in from um, all the cities and the involvement of our schools. So it's always a great, a great thing to, to have that kind of support. Next slide. All right, so now in terms of walking school buses, so I'm gonna kind of talk about sort of the evolution again of our walking school bus program, some of our successes, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Betsy to kind of talk about some of the challenges and then some of her firsthand accounts um, working with a couple schools, which I think will be really uh, helpful and I'm, I'm great for you all to hear. So um, in terms of our walking school bus program, um, it all started in 2012. So again, our program, Safe Route School, the school program started in 20, 2008, but in 2012 we received a grant um, to start the walking school bus, and um, the following year we were able to hire two uh, coordinators to really go out to the schools and um, try to recruit schools to participate. Um, we also developed the Google Map tool, which I'll talk about in a sec, um, and also a, a Safe Route to School countywide plan. So we had a, a plan developed um, that uh, got buy-in from our advisory committee that, that's used now that, that's gonna be updated in 2018. So in 2014, we had 16 elementary schools on board with 33 routes safe routes around each of these schools. Um, in the, the following year, we're fortunate enough to uh, get another grant, ATP1 grant, to work with 15 additional schools across the county. Um, and so we, we started with these, just these two coordinators um, working in around 30 or so schools. And so um, last year, um, and a little bit before that, uh, we had grown to my position in terms of administrator and three program coordinators, along with uh, Solano County Public Health as a partner to really try to um, expand this program. But what we learned this, this just last year is in terms of implementation is how to make this sustainable, which again, Betsy will talk about some of the challenges that we face. I may be familiar with some of you that have been trying to keep these going. Um, and right now uh, we sort of, are, we're, we're currently working with 11 schools and hoping to increase that again. Um, based on some of these challenges, there's been some things that, that we've learned that we've been able to um, evolve from. So next slide. And so in terms of success, so we worked with over 40 schools um, across the county um, starting these walking school buses. Um, we continue to have funding to, to support coordinated staff. So our, our agency, STA, and the cities and the mayors um, and the county have all supported us and, and continue to support our staffing. Um, we have continued to have buy-in from school, uh, officials and city leadership as well. Um, we developed a Google, Google Map tool. I'm gonna to talk about that in a sec. And then um, Betsy will talk about a little bit about our, our successful model over at Callison Elementary as also. Next slide. So just a little bit about our Google Map tool, um, and you can check it out on our website um, on that link below. Um, you know, it's what we did, we worked with Full Frost and Associates to develop this customized tool where each of the elementary and middle schools across the county can um, pick their school and figure out, find out the safe routes, um, the routes around their schools so that they, they can plan walking school buses and walking programs around. Um, so it's, it's a really great tool that a lot of parent schools use, that we use um, to help find routes. We're, we're in the process of updating them, but it, you know, it's, because it's customized to each school and each school is unique, um, it really helps the schools to really plan out where, where the routes are and figuring out other strategies from those maps that I think have been beneficial. Um, one last thing before I pass it over to Betsy to say is that you know, we're, um, like I said, constantly evolving our walking school bus program. Um, we're looking at uh, sort of paid models, how to pay part-time staff to do that, and we're um, piloting a, a project with Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District and, and potentially Vallejo and Vacaville School Districts to um, pay part-time staff to help run the walking school buses, um, since sometimes volunteers and recruiting them could be an issue. So I'm gonna hand it over, over to Betsy to kind of talk more about that. Okay, so uh, when our program first started, our focus was solely to start walking school buses at schools. And initially we had good, good success getting these schools to implement the traditional walking school bus model. And some of these walking school buses lasted a year, two, or two, maybe three. But after a while, we noticed that they started falling off, and 
due to uh, the challenge of sustaining them. And uh, some of those factors are, next slide please, uh, school staff turnover is, has been a problem for us. Principals leave yearly sometimes. Teachers and uh, school champions, such as staff who have been involved with the program, leave. So once the next school year comes around, there's not that person to you know, hand the baton off to, so to speak. Um, another challenge is making, um, well, let me go to the volunteer recruitment. Getting volunteers is always a problem at schools. There just aren't as many parents that volunteer. Uh, it's usually a small percentage of parents compared to the larger population that actually are involved in schools in their children's schools. So getting them to, uh, you know, volunteer for one more thing is, is always a challenge. Uh, another one is the one size fit all uh, traditional walking school bus doesn't necessarily work for all schools. Um, each school is is unique and. and and how it's run and what it what it needs. So um, we've noticed that we we had to address that at some point. And then building uh, the walking school bus in or walking into the school culture again, um, it's difficult to do because uh, if the program isn't isn't lasting from year to year, it just doesn't doesn't become part of, of that school culture. So what we've learned is that we've had to reestablish walking school buses every year, and again, that's a very time-consuming thing. And we've recognized that we need school champions. We need those school champions, such as the principals, the parent volunteers, et cetera, to take ownership of the program, that they actually need to lead the program. It can't be us who are constantly uh, trying to get them to do it every year. So what we need to do was to um, overcome some of those challenges and keep the schools engaged from year to year. And one of the uh, strategies that we came up with was to offer schools the choice of either doing a walking school bus or some kind of walking program. The idea is just to get the kids walking no matter what it is, be it, you know, using that, either one of those models. And some of the walking programs that we've had success with include uh, a Walking Wednesday, uh, Walker Wheel or Wow Day or a Fit Friday. Uh, let's see. Can we go back a slide? Okay. Um, okay that's one more, right, Nicole? Yeah, go yeah, back. One more. One more. Um, this here is a picture of um, the walking, one of the walking school bus routes at Callison Elementary in Vacaville. That's the walking school bus leader on the left, he is a paid school staff. Um, this is on the lower left hand side is one of the banners that we had made for the school. There's actually two of them um, put up on fences around the school. And uh, we also had yard signs at some of the schools as well with a similar design to promote the program. Um, I want to get back to um, some of the challenges again and how we, the strategies of, of, of overcoming those challenges. And what we found that we needed to do was to customize the offering to fit the school's needs. So we have our traditional walking school bus, but we also found that we needed to come up with some type of uh, or hybrid, what I like to call hybrid walking school bus, which is, has the elements of a traditional walking school bus, but it's tweaked to accommodate the school's needs. And again, using school staff to lead walking school buses or walking uh, programs um, has proven to be very successful in sustaining the uh, program. Okay. Um, so right now, I'm going. I'm going to talk about uh, two of the programs that we customized to. Uh, uh, meet the school's needs and, uh, again, just get kids walking and get physical activity um, for the kids at the schools. Um, the first school we don't, I was going to talk about is Calvin Elementary, which is the one with the other slide. And this school is in its third year with a self-sustaining walking school bus. Um, how it came about was the principal 
had concerns about safety and traffic around her school. It was a huge problem. She didn't know what to do about it. She decided to work with the city and police, call them in uh, and try to come up with some sort of solution. And what they decided to do was to close the school parking lot to all traffic. So the parents could no longer come in to the, into the school grounds or into where the front office is, drop the kids off and snarl traffic. They had to come up with a different way to get their kids as close to school as they as they could. So after that, she contacted uh, our program and told us that she wanted to start. Um, you know, what could we do to help? And we suggested that she start a walking school bus. And she wanted to do this because she wanted to offer the parents an option to get their children safely to school. That it was another way that they didn't necessarily have to be driven there. And she decided that she wanted to use school staff leaders. This was just something that she was going to put into her budget and use instead of having volunteers leading walking school buses. So for the last three years, they've had a staff-led walking school bus with three routes daily in the morning and the afternoon, and it runs uh, rain or shine. It's been very successful. Um, they have had some challenges along the way with participation. Um, and, the staff, and some staff turnover, but they have been committed to the program. It really has become part of the school culture, and they are continuing to pay their staff to lead the walking school buses. And even with the turnover of the principal who initially started that program, uh, it's been taken over by the assistant principal, and she sees it as a positive part of their school. Um, that it is a part of their culture, and she wants to keep it going, and she says that she always uses it as a kind of a selling point when people, when parents, prospective parents are looking at schools to send their children to. She always mentions the Walking School Best Program as something that um, they could possibly take advantage of um, as a parent. Okay. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, about Peyton. So another example of our evolution of the walking school bus program and to really find any way to get into the school um, to offer some type of walking program is at Payton Elementary School. And they started a WOW Wednesday or Walker Wheel Wednesday program um, March 1st. And this had always been a very um, a school that's been very involved with safe routes throughout the years. They, about four years ago, they did have a traditional walking school bus led by a parent champion um, and also one of our SR2S staff members who was a parent there. And they both led the walking school bus, but um, as time went on, participation dropped. Both of those uh, leaders had to leave the school or left the school, so the walking school bus just kind of went by the wayside. The school still continued to be very involved in our program. They participated in International Walk to School Day, Bike to School Day. They had bike rodeos. They returned our travel surveys, so we knew that they were supportive of the program. Um, and we had really developed a rapport with the principal, having um, worked with her for you know several years. And we realized that this was an ideal school to try and get some sort of walking program in to, into. And um, with persistence, we kept emailing, or I kept emailing the, the assistant principal to encourage her to start some kind of program because the school does have a lot of walkers anyway, and we just thought that it, I thought it would be a really good fit. So after several months um, of emailing and giving gentle nudges as to, you know, please meet with me. We did discuss um, having both, I, I gave her both options to either start a walking school bus, traditional walking school bus, or some kind of walking program. And she decided that she really liked the idea of a Wow Wednesday. Um, she liked the health benefits of it. She really wanted to um, promote that um, physical activity in her school. So we decided to go with the WOW Wednesday model. And um, part of the uniqueness of this particular program is, once again, 
school staff is leading these, these um, routes. There's three off-site routes led by school staff. Um, the, um, the leader meets them every, every Wednesday in the morning at a particular spot and gives them, greets them, praises them for coming, and gives them a charm, a different charm every week that they put on a charm bracelet and some of the kids hang it on their backpacks. And this is sort of their you know, reward for, for, for walking that particular uh, week. Um, not only does it um, promote walking, but kids are encouraged to either ride a bike or their scooter to school as well. So that, that all counts as as, uh, as part of the WOW celebration. Um, some of the other things that I provided for the school, as you can see in the lower uh, right-hand corner, is a uh, yard sign that we have at each of the three meetup spots. Um, there's also some around the school. We have banners with a similar design that are on the fences as well. The principal, or assistant principal, has told me that the popularity is growing. It just started March 1st. The kids really like the charms, and uh, kids are saying that uh, the ones that don't walk want to know how the kids, how the kids who have these charms got them. So it's, it's kind of a fun incentive to get the other kids um, to get walking, and it really has become part of the school culture. It's uh, the principal has done a really good job publicizing the event, um, the weekly thing. So again, it's building momentum and um, really starting to, to take hold there. And in the fall, we're thinking about starting um, at some kind of other incentive for the kids, be it um, like a monthly drawing where we could have um, a raffle prize uh, for the kids that walk for that month. So some of the things that I've learned um, with both of these programs and, and walking school buses in general is that it does take a lot of persistence and patience to start a program and to really build that rapport with the principal. Uh, schools are busy, and unfortunately, safe routes isn't always a, isn't always their top priority. But if you keep keep at them, you know, keep the conversation going, let them know that you're available. Um, they will come around. A lot of them have come around. Um, we've also learned that we need to customize and adopt, adapt pr program to fit the school's needs. Again, every school is different. The school didn't want to use volunteers. They were willing to use school staff. So uh, they made that, that commitment to getting their teachers out there. And we also want to let schools know that we're here to support them, and we really want to make the process as easy as possible. The less work they have to do, the better. And again, they're going to take ownership of something that isn't difficult to do, that just becomes a part of the natural uh, part of the school um, day or week. All right, Betsy, I'm going to um, ask you to advance to the next slide. This is wonderful information, but we want to make sure that we also have enough time for our, our next presenter. It's been um, a really great presentation. Um, and what we're going to do, we have a few questions that have come in, and we'll just save those till after Jim's presentation. But thank you both to Lloyd and Betsy. That was really great. Um, so at this point, Jim, can you unmute your phone? Give us a sound check. Uh, yes, good morning. Great. Thank you so much, Jim. And um, why don't you take it away? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having uh, having me speak with this. I'm really excited. And I just want a big shout out to Safe Routes to School for putting this together and having both Solano and us on the phone. Um, it's a really important tool. And I think hopefully a lot of people will be able to launch the programs or at least take the next steps after today. So yes, we're really excited to be here. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, a little bit about us and our context, just so um, people know who we are and why we do what we do. Uh, we are a nonprofit. We're based here in Culver City, which is a small city of 40,000 surrounded by the megalopolis of Los Angeles. Uh, we were founded in 2011. Um, LA County, we serve all throughout LA County, which is close to 10 million people in uh, some 88 cities. So we're just one of those 88. Um, and we focus on education and encouragement programming um, with Safe Routes to School best practices behind us. 
Um, and it's been mostly successful over the last uh, six years or so. Uh, next slide. So the things that we do are we work with schools to help them develop um, effective walk and bike to school programming. Um, we always work to a school's capacity, as Solano so um, eloquently put it out there, every school is totally different. And some just aren't up to the tasks of what a program might have. So whether it's a once a year on International Walk to School Day or a monthly program or a weekly or a, a daily program, uh, we are there to support them and work within their skill set and not take them too far too fast. Um, we work with both, both walk-in and bike-to-school programming, so we try to cover the entire spectrum. Uh, next. We provide on-campus bicycle and pedestrian skills workshops, so we actually go during school time and we're often working through PE classes. Sometimes this is part of an existing Safe Routes to School funding and sometimes it's a self-funded program through school districts um, where we'll go to a school and literally work with every child in the school on bicycle bike skills and helmet safety and how to check their bikes before they go. So they work with, they end, they end up leaving with some kind of a skill set and hopefully a conversation with their parents afterwards. Next. And we host um, our bicycle skills workshops and walk and roll festivals, formerly known as uh, bike rodeos. We've kind of gotten away from that term a little bit simply because anybody that's not on this call has a hard time understanding what that really is. <laughs> so we, uh, we try to extend that conversation a little bit. And our skills workshops are small festival-oriented um, activities that work with things like cyclovias, um, where it's a short obstacle course and the kids go through it learning basically how to start and stop their bikes, how to check their helmets, um, how to avoid hazards and things like that. But our walk and roll festivals are much more comprehensive where the kids progress through various skill stations. We take them on group rides on the street so they can put that into practice. We almost always have bike repair on site. Um, and they're pretty, pretty extensive and um, like all day affairs. Uh, next, next slide. So um, why we do what we do. Um, our story is, is probably not that unique, although it's driven us to continue to do what we do. Um, I've been a cycling advocate for over 20 years. Um, first with the mountain biking um, organizations and then more recently, uh, more urban cycling. Um, in 2010, co-founded the Culver City Bike Coalition um, alongside um, of our current council member and former mayor, Megan Sally Wells. Um, and in 2010, I also attended a community meeting, which anybody who's on the phone who's either worked with a city or a school district has been to dozens of these, where you've got all the stakeholders in the room and maps and consultants, and everyone's all excited about the future grant cycle that's coming up and offering their two cents worth. Um, and it was really a great meeting as the city was preparing to go after a million and a half dollars of Safe Routes to School funding. And then I asked the question of how long before we actually get this implemented. And by time the consultant counted down the timeline of how long it takes to apply and how long it takes to re receive the funding and go through the design and the implementation, it was two years. And frankly, I was just horrified by that. Like two years to get a, a strip of paint <laughs> or a sign in the ground. And that made me wonder, what can we actually do now? So I had, was really new to this and really didn't understand what Safe Routes to School was or even what a walking school bus was. Um, so I went home and I did some research, um, went to the Safe Routes to School websites and discovered what a parent can actually do. And um, next slide. So after a little bit of research and a conversation with our principal, we launched um, a walking school bus or a walking walk to school program at my daughter's elementary school, which was El Marino. And this was our launch here. This is about 18 kids or 12 kids. That's our mayor on the far left over there. And it's my little daughter on the far right um, in, on the roller skates, actually. And the whole idea was to get people you know, to be active and to reduce the amount of pollution. Um, after all the work in promoting this, we had 18 kids. And I was a little discouraged because there's over 800 kids at the school. And it kind of thought, we need to be able to grow this for all the right reasons that everybody wants to do. Um, and then we kept promoting it. Go to the next one. And we got that up to about 24 kids. And it was still really cool. And we're really excited about this. It was truly grassroots. I mean, I had no money in my pocket for this. And it was really about just promoting it and getting kids on board with it. So it, being it was small and it was manageable, still not nearly the goal that I had set out to achieve. So I did a little bit more research and found that offering incentives for kids, um, something that they can strive for, would really be successful. Go to the next slide. So we created a silver sneaker trophy and created a punch card system that would go out to the classrooms. And the winner, the class with the most participants, would receive the trophy. Um, and we go to the next slide here. We went literally overnight from uh, 18 to 24 kids to 160 kids, because that trophy meant something. 
now we have a small army of volunteers. We were sorting and uh, grouping uh, the punch cards, making sure that everybody was being counted. And this became a thing at the school. And it just shows that it doesn't take a huge amount of money. Um, literally, this was done for under $100. Um, what we say at every school is what we had at this school was two parent champions, myself and a couple of volunteers, and an enthusiastic parent uh, principal. And if you can get that on board, you can make things happen. Um, doing the sustainability and making that work, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but that is a challenge for this. But it really can be grassroots done, and it doesn't have to be overly complex. And I think that's one of the messages I wanted to bring today is we've got this fantastic resource guide that really does work, but you can also do it on a more scaled down level. So if you go to the next slide. So we continue to grow our program um, from the 160 on that day to 180 on the next International Walk to School Day. We had 240, and our high point was 320 kids. So that meant that we had 40% of the school's participation. And most of these kids generally don't walk to school, obviously. We, the, the school serves kind of like a magnet school in Culver City. It's not officially one, but it's a language immersion school. It's open to everybody in the city. So most of the parents are driving to school. I think we've got 87% that are driven to school on a regular basis. So that we were able to knock that down to 40% of participation, um, you can imagine the amount of cars not going to school, the amount of pollution coming out of the air, and the amount of excitement for the kids. And it really gave us a foundation from which to grow um, an entire program. Now, back to my original um, comment about the community meeting, the city ended up not going after their, in, their infrastructure grant that day, but they did go after their non-infrastructure grant. And that led us to an entire program here in Culver City. Next slide, please. Uh, next. And that gave us the foundation for the Culver City Walk and Rollers, which was um, a non-infrastructure, four-year federal, non-federal Safe Food School funded grant. It's comprehensive, um, district-wide programming that includes um, my role as Safe Food School coordinator. Uh, we cover five elementary schools and one middle school, so we're a bit more scaled down than the Solano project. Um, we have currently Safe Food School committees at all of our schools. We have walk-to-school programs at all of our schools. We have a district-wide tracking system, which are made up of key tags and barcodes, and we can, on any event, we know how many kids participated and what classrooms did the best. We have brought bicycle and pedestrian education um, during PE, adult and family education series, group rides, our annual walk and roll festival, and working with our police department, we've relaunched the bike patrol. So it's been pretty compre comprehensive, and one of the things I wanted to underscore with this slide is for anybody that's out there that's thinking of going for funding or feels you, you really want to have a robust program, that first bullet point is key of making it a four-year um, program. As anybody who's gone through this, and Solano pointed this out, is the first two years you spend just getting to know everybody. And it's not until that third year that things really start to come together, and it really doesn't become truly sustainable until the fourth year. Because you need to get the parents on board, and you need to guide them through a transition period um, of getting new leadership in there. And we're just now seeing how that works. So I, I advise this and I consult with this with school districts all the time. It's, it's very tempting for everybody to go after a two-year program and cover all their schools, but really you want four years, and it's even better to do less schools and create more of a pilot program to build, to build your guidance for years forward. Uh, next slide. So what I didn't know when I started ours at El Marino is that another school here in Culver City, Linwood E. Howe, have a hiking, Vikings, walking school bus program already in existence. Um, as most districts, our schools tend to work in silos. So this school has been doing it for eight years, and they've been really successful with it. And our role as um, an official program has been to kind of bolster that effort and help them transition from year to year and help it to grow. So they meet at a park every, every Friday, um, and they walk uh, about three-quarters of a mile to school. Uh, it's an ideal situation. It's a neighborhood street. It's a straight shot. It's bisected by maybe a dozen other cross streets. And so kids can join in all along the way. Um, and they might start with a dozen or so at the park, but they might end up with 50 or 60 by the time they get to school. Grassroots founded, um, volunteer led. This is one of our more successful programs. Um, and it, should, it really goes to show that they had did this with zero dollars. It really was just grassroots parents saying, we want to do this. It's important. It's what's in our DNA at the school. How do we make it happen? So we've been able to guide them through more safety techniques and be able to get them some incentives to go forward and kind of help them organize it and stay structured. But mostly, this can happen on its own if you wanted to. Next slide. 
So what, what part of the problem with, or not problem, but as we've been growing our Culver City program and we've addressed an awful lot of things, what we hadn't addressed was the walking school bus program and getting at least one completely off the ground from scratch. Um, it's a daunting task. It can be overwhelming. Um, it's easy to do a meetup site. It's easy to ha host a walk to school day. But to get an effective, sustainable, safely run walking school bus can be challenging. So my colleague, uh, Kara Sergio, and I sat down and thought, okay, if we're going to do this in Culver City, what does that mean? And we put together our list of what we knew it was going to entail and planned our first training workshop just about the time that Safe Roots was launching a webinar on, on their step-by-step -step guide. <laughs> and I, it, it, ironically, is we had planned it and set our date and you know, calendared it with everybody, and it turned out to be about a week before that webinar. Fortunately, we ended up postponing our meeting, and it was right after the webinar, so we were able to compare our notes with Safe Routes to the School and found out that they were actually in pretty close alignment. Um, so we put together our list of what we wanted to do, the training workshop, the route planning, walk leader recruitment, parent-student participation, promotion communication, and launching it, and then reviewing it, matched that up with the step-by-step -step guide, found a lot of correlation and a lot of support in the program on how to get this to the next level. Next slide. So this was our parent meeting, our first workshop. We had Culver City Police Department on hand. We had parents from a couple of different schools there. But we went into this knowing that whatever parents show up are the ones that we would work with, whatever schools were present. Um, if we didn't get all the schools, and in this case we did not, then that's okay. They're not ready for that kind of programming, so we worked with the schools that we did have. Um, and at this meeting, if we can go to the next slide, we laid out maps. Um, you can see on the right we had large maps um, blown out of blown up so we could draw on them and mark them up and really find out where people are coming from and what they're able to do as walk leaders. We had looked at a lot of different things, um, uh, including uh, things like proximity maps that show where people actually live. But in this case, we were basing it on where our walk leaders were coming from because we knew if they were walking a consistent route and that was, that was already in place we'd be able to get other families to, to join along. And it turns out they actually live in some of the, the denser areas, so it kind of worked really nicely. From the map on the right, we created the map on the left that shows the routes and the meetup sites and directed families to where they can go to join in the fun. And these are typical walking school buses. They start with just a couple of kids at a couple of spots, and by the time they get to school, we've got 30 to 40 kids joining in from a couple of different directions in the school. And it's really made a big difference in giving the school a weekly rallying cry, excuse me, a weekly rallying cry and um, some direction on where they can participate. You can go to the next slide. So these are a couple of our walk leaders. That's Joyce and Tom. Um, they've been with the program from the very beginning. And we needed to recruit additional leaders. So I can't stress this factor enough. When you're looking for, for leaders, just like when you're looking for parents and participate, participants, you've got to cover every single basis that's at your disposal. So through the weekly newsletters and the online blasts, flyers at school events, personal ask and parent portals, whatever they might be, take advantage of all of them because you never know where those parents are going to come from and you never know what they're paying attention to. Next slide. We also looked into promoting this. How do you get people to participate? And again, it's the same thing. Promote it to every avenue that you've got available. So we created a flyer. We gave it a cute name. The mascot is a dolphin, so in this case it was join a pod, join the fun. We, we were clear about where you can meet up, where the map was. Um, the route, the meetup sites, the routes, and the times were all listed on there. This flyer is only used on the school website. There was concern about if you broadly publish where people are meeting up and where the kids are going to be, are there Megan's Law issues? So we kept this flyer on an internal basis and created a separate one that could be facing out towards the community. But again, we took advantage of every, every opportunity we had to get the, the word out there. Next slide. And then we launched. We practiced the timing, and we communicated with walk leaders and faculty, made sure everybody knew what was happening. We developed a communication tree amongst the walk leaders, so if somebody was going to be late or was running behind or if they were not going to be able to make it that day, all the other walk leaders knew what was happening, and they could cover for them accordingly. And I'm happy to say that on the first day of launch on this, we had over 30 people participating, 30 kids participating. A lot of them were not able to participate in the monthly program, and most of them, if not all of them, actually drove on a regular basis. So we know we took 30 cars out of the, the queue around the SKU, around the school every morning. So we would consider that a pretty successful one. Um, our next step, and go to the next slide, is to start coordinating with the police department on doing a formal safety training, getting all of our walk leaders in a room. Um, we've had their schedule and reschedule about four different times now, but we're going to make it happen. 
Um, we want to continue promoting it and recruiting it and tweaking our times. And we've got one area of the school that we're not currently walking from, so we're looking for, for uh, group leaders right there. Um, some of the things that we covered during our initial um, planning was liability, and we came to an agreement with the school district on what that would look like and how to go about that. Turns out in our case, we're addressing it by, we certainly can't, we know we can't ask every parent who's going to walk with their kids to sign a liability form or go through a training process. But our walk leaders, those who are going to carry a vest and, and, and be a formal leader, do need to go through the training and they do need to go through the typical volunteer process that any school district would have. So whatever those guidelines are in your area, that would be a good model to go by. Um, and then, that, and most, as it turns out, almost all of our walk leaders, in fact, I think all of them, have, they're already volunteering at the school. They've already gone through that process. So it was, it was easy for them to just be signed in and registered. But as we grow this program, and our goal is for this year is to work out all the kinks so that next year we can um, launch it successfully from the get-go. Uh, next slide. And that's pretty much what we've got here. So what did I get out of the guide and how did we use that um, um, as our basis? It helped us give us some structure, so if anybody's downloaded it, I suggest you follow it pretty closely because it will give you that structure. You'll learn terminology so you can talk with your um, city staff, like things like proximity maps and walkability assessments, and definitely use the resources that are in there. Um, there's, there's all kinds of worksheets and assessment guides in there that you can use to help you guide your, your programming going forward. So I don't want us to run out of time if there's some questions there. So I will say thank you again for the opportunity, and I'm happy to answer any questions or e either now or even offline later on. Yes. All right. Um, that was tremendous, uh, Jim, such a wealth of information, and I also appreciate how you brought it back to the toolkit. Um, we actually only have um, a, one question from the chat function. Um, and, but I think we did cover it because um, there were lots of discussions about how uh, one size does not fit all and, um, and we had some examples of different schools um, where um, there were some choices given to the principal, a menu of choices of, about how to get started. Do you guys, um, let's see, maybe I can um, have Jim take that first and then um, uh, Lloyd and Betsy can also jump in. So any just kind of succinct um, messages about um, that whole one, not one, I think our one size fits all. Absolutely, yeah, we've worked with a number of schools at, at have Lloyd and team. So um, we, we, here in Culver City, we've got like one of every type of school, even though we've only got five. And so we really, as I mentioned before, we really work to capacity. So if you can have that conversation with the principal, find out what they're willing to support, what they're willing to do. Um, if you can speak with PTA, that's great. Do you have volunteers in place? Um, and that will guide your decision. You know, we've had some schools where the, all that they can manage is on International Walk to School Day, having a table out in front and welcoming people to come in because they've got two volunteers and they can't be there early enough to lead a group. And that's fine. You can just celebrate the success of it. We've got other schools where we might have a dozen volunteers and they can do a, a weekly or daily walking program, and that's fantastic also. So it's really important to understand the school and the culture and how do you build from there. Appreciate that. Um, Lloyd and Betsy, is there something you wanted to add? I just, I just second what um, Jim had said. I mean, I, I think just the important thing, and I just reiterate again what Jim said, is that, that you know it's it's really meeting the schools where they are. So a lot of them just don't have time, or don't, or think they don't have the time to do it, and that's and that's totally fine. I think we're here to make it as easy as possible, and so um, if we can't do it this year, we'll try it next year. I think that's the approach that we've been doing, and fortunate enough to be able to. Um, Scale where that's okay, but I understand sometimes there's issues if you don't have schools in your um, area or whatnot, you're trying to work. But I think you really have to meet them where they are. So I definitely second what you mentioned. Great, I appreciate that. Um, we we do have a few more questions that are coming in. However, we are also pressed for time, and so we always want to be sensitive um, to the schedules that we um, set. Um, what I'm going to do is um, let you know that. Um, Jane, is, I know you're multitasking, but if you can actually forward um, to the next slide, two slides, you'll have our, all of our speaker contact information. Um, and we know that um, some of them might, based on the presentations, that you'll have specific questions for specific speakers. We encourage you to reach out to them um, because they are experts and they've been um, wonderful in um, serving as a resource to the ATRC. Um, I'm, Jane, if you go to the um, back one slide, 
Um, I do want to reiterate that we will be um, soliciting feedback on this webinar um, via a survey gizmo, so if you can complete that when it's sent to you, we'd appreciate it. Um, and then if you jump two slides ahead, um, this is just a reminder that across the state there are different um, regional technical assistance coordinators based at the a ATRC. So this is contact information. This is also available on um, the ATRC um, uh, website, which is ca uh, ATP resources org. Um, so on that note, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank our panelists for their wonderful presentations. I um, want to deeply apologize that we didn't have as much time for question and answers. Um, but again, we want to continue the dialogue um, and, and um, promote the dialogue. So please um, feel free to send those questions. Um, and anyone who's submitted a question um, at this late hour, we'll make sure that, that you do get a response. So thank you again, and um, have a tremendous day, and good luck with your walking school bus efforts.